Um, okay, so with that note, I'm going to start with with the first question that I wrote down that I sent out, um, and you know, feel free to to volunteer your comments. But um, I wrote on page 12, the author writes, "Racism in America exists to exclude people of color from opportunity and progress, so that there is more profit from others deemed superior. You will get more because they exist to get less." And this made me wonder. There's two parts of this, and one of them comes up in chapter six, chapter seven. If you were working at a company, if you are working at a company, and you know you found out that a person of color was making far less than you, and you had, you know, the same job title, or if management decided that they wanted to start leveling the playing field, would you be willing to take a salary cut to bring up the salary of of other people who are? Kind of the same rank as you and when this question was presented to me i felt very defensive at first and i thought why should i have to give up what i make i think that's the company's responsibility the the company should figure it out and, and get that money but when i was reading the book i thought well i think that's a part of my white privilege uh that i need to acknowledge is is that that like maybe i do have to take some responsibility and, and i don't i don't know actually what I think about it. I think it depends on how much money you make. Um, if you made a lot of money, it might be easier to let go of some of your salary. If you didn't, it would be a lot harder. But I was just curious what you thought. Like, you know, is it the company's responsibility? What if the company doesn't have the money? How how to level that playing field? Yeah, I I, I think that that gets to the heart of a lot of different things. Money's I don't know if money's harder to talk about than race, but it's pretty close. Like for as much as money influences our country, we don't talk about it um, as, as much as you'd think, or at least in, in real raw terms. Um, I should find out if our bosses are on here before I continue to say, but my opinion is that the company is the one that needs to pay. Um, I, I actually, I, I think the best way to be, an ally is to be cognizant that we think of our positions in, in any company as being largely credited to our own abilities, our own sort of stick to itiveness that, that it's a credit to us and it is. And, and I, I think, I think Egioma's point specifically when she's talking about how do you, how do you advocate and the, the topics of privilege and intersectionality specifically are about understanding that, other, other people face a, a different and, and more comprehensive set of challenges when they're not white. And that it's not a matter of you giving up money so, so someone who is black or someone who is uh, indigenous peoples can make more, but understanding that that person, that the, the sort of the weight of the company, the weight of the, 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 the hiring practices comes to bear on them in a, it, in a more pointed way than it does on you potentially and finding a way to advocate for them as well. That it's not, hey, whatever you make, that's up to you and the company. I, I've been told you're worth the deal you negotiate, um, which there's some truth to that. We're so scared to tell people how much we make. And, and I think a lot of it, my honest opinion is that it comes down to, we're afraid that other people are going to know how little we actually make. And we'd prefer that they assume we make more than we do than to tell them and remove all doubt. I, I think, I think it was workers. If we all knew what each other made, it would put us all in a, in a stronger collective bargaining position. And I think that when it comes to two issues of race, being cognizant that their wages are being held down by more cumulative pressure and being able to help and push back for them, as opposed to I've gotten the lion's share of the bounty and now it's time to me to, for, for me to fork over some of my ill-gotten gains. Yeah, I mean, in Seattle, one company that went for wage transparency is Molly Moon's Ice Cream. And it was a big news story, I think it was last year. And a lot of people in the public were like, oh my God, that's so crazy. But you know, they didn't just one day go, okay, everybody, this is what you make. They spent a year before they made it transparent, working on it and making sure that everybody was being paid fairly. And they, you know, they, they kind of restructured the way that they paid people so that it, there was a reason they could tell you why you make this much and why you don't. It wasn't just random 
you know, numbers. Uh, and, and after reading about that and covering that story, I just thought that's the way to go because I mean, again, I don't know if our bosses are listening, but for me, I, I had a hard time negotiating until I became a certain age. And it wasn't until I found out what one of my coworkers made uh, that I started really pushing for a raise because it was someone who had way less experience than me and a, a job that was uh, a, a lower rank than mine. And that like put the fire in me and I finally got a raise and was being paid how much I should be. So I think this is really important when it comes to equality between races because if it was transparent, then you know, you would be held accountable as a company and you'd have to explain why people are making different amounts. And, and I think it's necessary and you're right, Danny, people don't like to talk about it in this country. And I grew up in that culture of my parents telling me it's rude, don't ever ask anybody what they make. And I think people are starting to open up a little bit more, but I think it's still uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, and we have Heather who is gonna speak. So I, can you guys hear me okay? We can. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So for me, I think, you know, I work in the public sector. I work for a school district. And when you work in the public sector, you have set pay schedules based on this. And it shows you the levels. And this education gets you this or this many years on the job. So for me, it, I was all like, sure, wages should be public knowledge because for so many of us that work in that public sector already, they are public knowledge because we are, you know, funded by tax dollars and people want to see that. So I think if the private sector were to institute something similar, that would help this gap. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very good point, Heather. Um, the other thing that would help it is if employees shared it across, across their, their employee ranks, even in situations where there aren't uh, unions and unions have become significantly less powerful. Um, uh, H hunger in the comments that I think there should be more transparency on what people are making. So it's easier to determine if, if there are differences. I, I, I agree with that. I, even sharing it within your, your workspace or your work cluster gives people a better understanding of, of, of what is happening. Um, and it takes a little bit of risk and vulnerability and in some cases, humility to say that. I think something that we're learning, you know, reading this book and just watching what's happening in the world is, you just have to question why we do things because there's a lot of things in society that we just do because it's always been done that way. And, and the way that wages are set up is just like that. It's like, well, that's just how it is. It's always been that way. You just don't share what you make. And it's like, well, why, you know, why? And so you kind of have to question it. And I think that's a lot of the systemic racism is questioning, you know, well, why have we always done this? Why haven't we done this instead of just following along with these things that just feel normal, but, they're not normal. We just made them up at some point and told ourselves that they are. It's also to the advantage of the bosses. And there might be other, not just my bosses, but other people that are bosses. It's to the advantage. It works to the advantage of the employer when, it, when it's not shared. And it's not that they only want to keep the wages down of people of color. They want to keep everybody's wages down. And because of the way different factors work, because there is more weight that ends up being placed um, and, and more obstacles placed in the way of people of color, that, that's one of the things is that their work tends to be dis devalued. And by sharing wages, you can, you can identify when that's happening. Um, Mike Sievers wants to speak to affirmative action. Hey guys. Hi. Hey Mike. I thought this was just kind of relevant, like in terms of equaling the playing field at work. There's a chapter where she talks about affirmative action. And I don't know if that's where people have gotten to yet, but it was really interesting to me because it seems like a lot of times that gets spun as an unfair favoritism towards minorities. Um, but she points out it's usually a goal and not a quota. <laughs> and it's often lower than the representative percentage of people. So if there are 15% black people in an area, the company might have a goal of 10% employment. So it really gets hard to argue against it and say, well, that's not fair that, you know, you'll hear people saying it's not fair to choose minorities for that reason. Well, she points out, then you're arguing that white people need the five, 10, 15% advantage or whatever it is. You're actually 
demanding less competition for yourself by making the argument that, well, you should just compete harder or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And like how she said, it should match the population. So if you're living somewhere and there's 10% of the population that's black, then 10% of the population that the company or the school should be black as well. Yeah. And then she said, if you disagree that the percentage should be the same, then are you saying that you don't think the minority, the person in the minority can do the job as well? Yeah. And it gets really hard to, you know, make that logical argument, I think. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the, the least we can do. And she says in the book that it's actually not enough. And if there's any flaw with it, that it's actually, we can't really stop at affirmative action, but I was really convinced that that a lot of a lot more companies should do that. It's an interesting way she framed it, Mike, and I think that that's one of the things that's powerful about that chapter is it doesn't put in this question of how do we how do we increase the number of black employees or the number of Latino employees? How do we increase our diversity as, hey, diversity is the goal. It's the question of if you look at a, a workforce and the population in that area is 75% white, but it's 90% white at this business, what's going on there and why is that happening? And if, if, if the ranks of your employees don't reflect the demographics of the area, why is that? And I think in a lot of cases, it's the, the people who make hiring decisions or the pipelines that groom employees for that place, that there's kind of a self-selecting, it, 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 can, it can breed conformity and, and that those percentages and holding out as a goal of let's, let's get our workforce to look like the community we're hiring from is, is kind of, in, in some ways, it's, it's a boot in the butt to the people who are recruiting for that job of let's, let's work to make sure that we're not taking the, the people that all of our friends know and we're only taking recommendations, but making sure that we're drawing from, from the breadth of the community, both gender and, and race, when it comes to the makeup of our workforce. Yeah, she even commented too that white women have benefited the most from affirmative action. Mm. It's very interesting. Yeah. So one of the things I've just been most curious about is just if anyone has any ideas or if you've already done something about kind of what you want to do beyond the book, because this is kind of like the step one, you know, educating yourself, learning all of these things, and then what are you going to do with it? Um, and, you know, we're talking about wage transparency, affirmative action. As far as affirmative action, that seems like it's something... Well, I, I'm not totally sure if it, it's something that has to be legislated, but, you know, transparency is something that you could go to your boss and ask for or like rally your coworkers and have everybody get together and ask for it if it's something you wanted. So I was just curious what kind of ideas people had, because in the book, she'd mentioned things that I hadn't thought of, like, you know, PTA meetings uh, being at certain times, making it harder for certain parents to to go and, and be involved. And that's something that can be like a grassroots thing that if you're in a PTA, you can start to notice those things um, and change them and things that you could do at your work or, you know, anything. I was just curious if people had ideas. Let's go to H Hunger. I think Stephen, is, is she up in the queue? Or he up in the queue? I'm sorry. Hello. Can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I work in the engineering field and I also do hiring in the engineering field. It's just fine that we're not getting a lot of minority applicants. I think really where it starts is in the idea of just getting more people in minorities knowing that they can get into these fields, you know, finding out much earlier on what's inhibiting them or encouraging them. So for me, my one thing that I thought about, you know, is, you know, being kind of a, you know, getting to the later part of my career and stuff and having the experience that it could be pretty rewarding for me and maybe beneficial for others to go more into the high schools or the colleges and trying to encourage more people. You know, these are opportunities in these fields and this is where this field is expanding. So there's, there's going to be job opportunities for it. So we're really trying to push more people at a young age to get into that field so that when recruiters are looking and opening up positions, they get a lot more applicants from minorities. 
Yeah, there's there's a lot of studies that show that if you don't see yourself represented somewhere, you feel like you don't belong there. Um, and that's true with minorities and with women. I have a friend who's a professor in astronomy, and she said that that happens in STEM all the time. You know, when you're a freshman in college, the classes will be 50-50 as far as, you know, men and women. And then every year that you progress, there's fewer women, fewer women. And by the time you get to the top, you know, there could just be like a handful of grad students. And, and she said, you know, if you don't see yourself there, or if you look at the professors and there's not many women, or you see that they're unable to have a family, then the chances of you pursuing that are much smaller. And, and I think the same goes for race, you know, like, I mean, even if you do get an internship somewhere and you see that everyone working there is white, you might just not feel like you belong. And so I think that's important what you said, like doing some kind of mentoring, however you choose to do that volunteering your time, I think is really great. Do you have any thoughts on some of the the obstacles that that people of color might face when they're when they're looking or or any barriers in pursuing engineering as a, as a career or or even in in school and in higher education? Um, well, I think one just the cost of of education in general. So mm -hmm. if you didn't have like parents that could help you out or a support system that didn't require you to do a whole bunch of working at the same time. And one of the things that really eye opened to me is you'll um, you'll have people describe how they they went to school and they kind of worked at the same time and got through. Well, that's no longer the reality. Even if you're working full time, you're not affording college nowadays. So that's an obstacle just to getting into those higher fields and stuff. But then I think also just early on getting the more interest. So if you had a hundred you know people going in there and you know that you're going to weed out probably. 60% uh, of them, but if you only got a few minorities going in, then they, you weed out almost all of them and stuff. So you got to get a lot more people interested in it. And I think, you know, for the most part, when I find, you know, I talk to somebody that I'm an engineer, they're like, well, what do you do? You know, they, they don't even, you know, in school, they don't even really realize what this is possible and what job opportunities there are out there for engineers and how just having that schooling gets you a lot more opportunities for choices on which way you want to go or where you want to get hired. I still don't totally know what an engineer is, so. <laughs> We're magical. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you're weird. <laughs> yes. Um, was Sandy up next? I believe so. Sorry, I accidentally, <laughs> accidentally <laughs> muted myself. Um, yeah, so I, one of the first things that I've um, become aware of over the last, you know, couple months, um, I work for a nonprofit um, in South Lake Union. Um, it's called the Center for Wooden Boats. And um, we have a community that is mostly white and mostly male, which is something that has always been kind of known in boating and sailing and whatnot. I'm a sailor too. Um, but for me, I noticed that I'm actually not really aware of my minority um, because I grew up in Seattle with a lot of white people and I actually feel pretty comfortable around them, which is kind of a reverse I think experienced than a lot of other minorities. And um, so I've always thought as my workplace as being super open and um, friendly and, you know, we're all welcoming, nobody there makes people feel uncomfortable. Um, but I did notice that we're not actually being proactive in reaching out to um, other communities. And so I think in the past that we have, we used to have sort of job skills programs that reached out to underserved youth and things like that. Um, but with funding and staff turnover that those sort of things have um, gotten lost. And so um, in a conversation I was having with one of my friends uh, and she's black and she was talking about she had never really experience water activities growing up because she doesn't know how to swim. And that's something that we hear a lot of from um, people of color in the community. And um, our nonprofit is all about getting people access to the water, um, no matter your experience level or things like that. Um, so 
uh, one of the things I've done is kind of started a committee at our work to make sure that we are constantly trying to do outreach for, you know, not necessarily have, we have specific programs that are meant to focus on serving um, underserved youth and minority groups and whatnot, but I think it's something that we really need to fold into just all of our programming and everything that we do, like that should always be a thing. <laughs> and it wasn't actually until a couple of weeks ago, I realized I'm the only person of color on staff <laughs> and we only have one board member who is a um, who's Asian as well. And so, um, you know, knowing that our community is not as diverse as we want it to be, even though, um, and I do our communications work and sometimes I'm guilty of like purposely noticing like, oh, somebody of color, I need to take that picture to show that we're diverse. <laughs> and, um, that makes me feel pretty terrible when I <laughs> realize that. So, um, but anyway, I, I was just, saying that um, that's one of the ways that I'm trying to do something within the yeah. work, the workforce. Um, so that was just an idea. If you work or volunteer somewhere, um, maybe, you know, getting people together to discuss how you can involve other communities is a place to start. Yeah, that's, that's so awesome. And I think, yeah, the key word is just being proactive and there was someone who wrote an article a few weeks ago that was criticizing book clubs and saying, oh, that's what white people do is when something happens, they just start a book club. But I think, like I mentioned last week, it's kind of the same as practicing, you know, Buddhism or whatever. It's like, this is a practice too. Even if you think you know these things, you it's just not at the top of your mind always. And reading this book is reminding you. And like what you said, Sandy, it's like, oh, I didn't even realize all these things. And that's why I think the education part is, is so useful because you might not have thought about it if you weren't reading the book. So I think that's so awesome. And um, yeah, it just takes somebody within a company to bring it up and, and be proactive and, and try to start something new. That idea of noticing who's not there is something that we don't often do. And I think that's just in general, because how, how do you notice who's not there? Like, how do you, it, 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 it's hard. And I, I think that the chapter about intersectionality like that was one of the things that struck me about about Egioma's construction there is that she gives you this whole range of how diverse, like we think of silos and there's a group here, there's Asian Americans, there's black, there's indigenous, there's Latino, then there's the big chunk of white people. Um, but it, all of those groups have tiers within them of various ranges of class, various ranges of ability or, or discipline, like all of these different things and trying to make yourself cognizant of, of who's not there or who might not be re represented kind of gives you an idea about who you can advocate for. Um, one of the things that I'm doing is, is I, I decided to audit what I read and what I watch and try to figure out, like I've, I've got a list, like I, I, I'm a pretty active reader, like who are the authors that I read and, and to make sure that I was looking at it, what's the last book I read by a black author that was not about race. Like that was, it was a fiction. And it turned out it was Colson Whitehead, uh, The Underground Railroad. And I read that last year. Um, but trying to make sure that I'm reading more diverse things and I'm not just reading uh, from, from one group of people and that I'm not just reading black authors when they're writing about race as well. So that was one of the things uh, tr to try to notice who's not in, in my reading my reading list? Whose books am I not reading? Whose shows am I not watching? Mike in Seattle. Hey. Um, Hi. About, uh, we were talking about like how to get involved in stuff. Like uh, Mike, the, I work in a pretty specialized small field. Um, but we have uh, one black employee who the, um, the boss has taken on um, a couple of years ago. And the short version is that I, I still have a lot to learn because uh, he does the driving, one of the drivers, and he got in an accident a couple, couple of months ago. And... Um, and I, in my head, I was like, and then he waited like 
a day before he told us and before he did anything about it. And I was rather upset. Like, why didn't you go to the police? Why didn't you talk to insurance? You know, all these different things. Luckily, this gentleman in the company, like, pulled me aside and kind of walked me through it about how this guy being black, like law enforcement is a completely different thing. You know, his interactions. And it's like, well, I knew that before, like in my head, um, it didn't resonate with me like in, in the moment or, and so I really had to like pause and step back and be like, you know, this could have been a really, you know, um, difficult thing, you know, given that there was um, no pictures, no witnesses, nothing. And so I, I really helped me to step back and just see how I just assume that this is how I would do it. And this is how he should have done it. Yeah. And the problem, you know, and so it's just been, and then reading the chapter, you know, about, about privilege too. And it's just like how um, I've been where I am right now is a lot because of who I am, or, I mean, you know, I'm white, I'm male, you know, I have a college education, et cetera. And so it's just, uh, it's, it was, it's really important for me to be just really mindful of um, trying to separate myself and see w what this other person, you know, is, might be going through. And um, I don't know if I'm wording that correctly, but um, one of the things that I want to get involved in is just um, uh, the mass incarceration problem. Um, I mean, that's a huge, huge thing. But I mean, the fact that there are private companies, you know, controlling some of the prisons. I mean, that I think that's just outrageous considering that companies are set up to make money. And so therefore you have to have inmates to make money. And it just seems completely yeah. in the face of everything, you know, that this country was set up to do. So um, that's all I got. And thanks for everyone being here. And I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there was something circulating this week about, I think it was like all the desks, the furniture that they use at the UW is all made by incarcerated people who are being paid, you know, cents on the dollar. And that's just really hard to hear when it's all of these students going to school, you know, using all of these desks made by people who won't have the opportunity to go to college because of the way that they're being treated and they're not being trained to come out and become better people. Um, I think the way that you phrased it, Mike, was perfect. And thank you so much for, for speaking. And Brian Mills, you're next. Um, yes, yeah, so th there's a couple of things that, that I've noticed as I've read the book, um, especially I think it was Mike Sievers that had mentioned the conversation, the, the chapter about equal opportunity. And what I found as I was reading that chapter was I was going through and I was thinking of, of sort of the, the excuses and the, the arguments that, that people use against uh, equal opportunity. And when we look at something in the workforce, um, and this has kind of you know, been around a lot of the comments that we've heard thus far, is when we look at things and we say, well, so-and-so isn't qualified for the job. It's not that I don't want to hire a, a black individual for this job, it's that they're not qualified for the job like, like a white person is say. And what that got me thinking about is that this all slides back to the point that this is this systemic thing that needs to be addressed. The reason that the black person may not have the education or the skills or whatnot to do it is that they were never given the opportunity to. And so I, I think that it's really, it, it, it's really the, the more that you read and the more that you think about it, the more sort of maddening it is, you know, to, to, to hear all of this. And, and in a lot of ways you feel helpless because it's like, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to give some of my money to other coworkers, you know, that maybe don't get more uh, and, and so forth. And so what it makes me want to do is, is, is fight for the change at, at sort of a, a, a systemic, um, you know, larger level government, uh, you know, those sort of things. But then also think about what you can do personally. Um, like I'm a Tableau developer and, you know, one of the things that I could do, you know, that, that I really wanted to do and talk to my company about is 
why don't we find somebody that, that doesn't have the opportunity to, to get an education, to do this kind of work, and let's help them, let's teach them, uh, and let's give them an opportunity to have a high paying job and to work in fields that a lot of people of color just, they, they don't have the opportunity because whatever the hurdle may be, it could be cost, it could be time, uh, any number of things. So I guess that's what I've seen um, in the book. And, and again, I, the, the, the conversation around equal opportunity was one that really, really hit with me because I look back in my history and some of the things that I may have said against equal opportunity at some point in time because I didn't understand it. And now that I understand it, it's like, oh man, these arguments that people use are so bogus and it's just so, it's so difficult to hear. So, so that's all. I, I think that's really well said, Brian. I, I, know, I know for me, when, when I think about or, or talk about that idea of how do you, how do you find the right qualified person? Cause that is, that is a word that gets used a lot, right? And, and it, it, it's not entirely invented. Like if you're gonna be an engineer, if you're going to be one of those, there's a certain amount of education that you have to go through and steps that you have to go through. And the, and the pool might not be as, as diverse as, as the rest of the city or the population that you're drawing from. And then to me, I guess the question becomes, well, why is that? And I don't think any of us would look at it and say, well, that's just a reflection of everyone's natural ability. No, it's because the playing field's all screwed up, right? Like who gets the opportunities and the, the relative affluence of schools between white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods. And then, that there's that question of okay, if if we're going to fix that, if we're going to change that, I, I think there's I think there's a two pronged approach. One is we try to invest in communities of color to make sure that people do get the education they need. Like that's that's one side of it. The other side of it is we have to look harder for qualified candidates. Like that's it might take more work to find a more diverse workforce, but well. I think we're all kind of benefiting from the way the system has been up. And if we have to do more work to make it fair for everybody else, I don't, I don't think that's, that's too much to ask. Um, so I, 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 I think that's, that's very well. I, I've worked in sports journalism, which is like 90% white male. Like it's not just incredibly white, it's incredibly male. And you will hear all of the time, the few black journalists or black radio hosts or people that are there like someone that person's a hack they only have the job because they're i was like man there are so many white people that have these jobs that are way more terrible than that guy is at his job like why don't we ever talk about how unqualified he is like that should be the dream we should all be able to be as unqualified as some of us doof white guys that get to hold on to the jobs and, and instead we get it turned around of like oh there's just not enough qualified people yeah I had seen a Trevor Noah video a few weeks ago that was talking about newsrooms and, and like Danny, I've worked in a newsroom my whole career and it's also very white and very male. And he was saying it was something I had never thought about before. He said, you know, one of the reasons that newsrooms are so white is because a lot of people of color can't afford to take an unpaid internship. And that's exactly how I got my job was because I was able to take an unpaid internship at a news radio station in college and then they hired me and I just kept going from there. But that was something I never thought of. You know, if you have to work, you can't spend 20 hours a week for free if you need to spend 20 or 40 hours a week actually being paid. And, and so along those lines, that's, that's the thing that I've kind of focused in on of thinking of what I could do. I talked to my boss about that and, you know, it's just in the early phases and I don't know what's going to happen, but just saying, can we pay interns? You know, we don't have that many. Um, it won't cost that much. And can we have an affirmative action program, you know, leave a slot open? I mean, all those things that kind of encourage someone uh, because you kind of have to get people when they're young to snag them, you know, when they're in college to keep them interested in a job so that you can get those people into the workforce. Uh, Lacey's up next. Added on. I wanted to add on to what Sandy said, because we used to work together and it was so good to see her, it is just to commend her for keeping up that fight because when I, to include more people of color, because we, when I had left, we were trying to reach out to multiple schools to get them to come down to the center and no one would take them up on these free courses. We had dollars to give. And it wasn't until there was a connection with one of the schools, they're like, okay, we can send someone. Well, then it ended up being a white young male who was a very hard worker, but, you know, try, 
you try and try and try. So a lot of it is education, education like you're, us reading this book so that people at the schools work hard to, you know, to reciprocate. So it's not just one sided. So, and so, and the grants are written so they're more inclusive so that she can offer more grants that are more inclusive, you know, in the wording and whatnot. But I, it's two ways. So the schools need to be educated to partner up with people who are trying to offer services too. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to share my coworker, um, thing I talked about last time. When we first hired her and we are a social justice company that I'm at now, we had a picture on the wall of three black women and she immediately saw that picture when she walked in and she said, that is so awesome. And I'm like, yeah, it's a cool picture. And she's like, no, you don't understand. I've never walked into a workplace where and seen a picture on the wall of people that look like me. Mm -hmm. And she's so upfront with me and I appreciate that. I've learned so much from her. And I was like, oh, I never thought about it, right? I never thought about the artwork on the wall and yeah. how that affects how comfortable you feel. Um, and now, cause I'm nervous, I can't remember what else I was gonna say. <laughs> That's okay. If you think about it in a little bit, just let us know. I, I had a similar experience. It was the same friend who was telling me earlier, the astronomer, about that, if you don't see yourself somewhere. And we have a lot of pictures up on the wall at Cairo of the people who are on the air, like your professional headshots. And at the time, several years ago, it was only men. And, and I noticed that and I felt really uncomfortable. And I went to someone and I brought it up because I didn't want them to think it was my ego saying, I want my picture on the wall. But I explained it just like what you said. I said, I, if we have female interns and they come in and they don't see that there's a single woman whose picture's on the wall, then how would they think that they could ever do this? And, and then, you know, slowly the women started to appear. But I think, I really think it is important. I think you're right. I did have one other thing, um, kind of back when Mike was sharing the story about the coworker that got in the accident. And that relates back to her story about when she was pulled over when she was 16 and just how traumatic that was. And what I would say is to challenge everyone here, you know, how are we going to take it a step further is go ask your black friends what driving incidents they've been in. And I can guarantee you that every one of them have had a situation. The most recent story a friend, my husband's coworker shared about his mom was in her 80s. She would not pull over. The cops were flashing their lights until she got to a well-lit road and people around in her 80s because she did not feel safe. Mm -hmm. And when she got pulled over, he's like, ma'am, I just wanted to tell you your light was out. But, you know, that was just, I wanted to share that it was so profound to me. Like, you know, if you don't think that injustice exists in our system, you know, you just need to ask a little bit more around the people you know and love and care about. That was from this last reading of getting up to chapter eight, that was one of the most striking things for me too and the most emotional because, you know, when I was pulled over when I was 16, when I reached for my glove box, the cop didn't say anything. I mean, that experience was crazy to me that he, you know, young lady, you could get shot doing this or putting his hand on his gun. That's never happened to me. And, you know, her brother having the same experience of, I've never had to say, I'm reaching for the glove box now. Here are my hands ever, ever, ever. And like the amount of tickets that I've gotten out of over the years, just like making up excuses, like I have to pee, whatever, and being let go. I mean, just, and, and the other part that was really emotional was just reading about how her brother was treated in school and, you know, how he basically got left behind. And I, I happen to know her brother a little bit. And it's just hard to imagine that this person managed to come out of that and become so successful and confident and, and an amazing artist when he was, you know, his confidence was so low. And I mean, the story about, I guess this is the, the, on the line of like bringing things up and Eva who's in the conversation had sent a couple questions just before we started the chapter. Oh, I'm sorry. This is actually one chapter forward. So I'm sorry if you guys hadn't read chapter nine, but there's a story where um, Ijeoma and her brother go to stay with some family friends for a week because her mom goes out of town and they are white and they get along really well, but then they experience racism from other kids and they, their friends don't stick up for them. The white friends don't stick up for Ijeoma and, and Aham and you know, one of the questions Eva wrote, like, is, are you willing to stand up for someone, whether it's at the workplace or in public, if you 
see discrimination, you know, do you have the guts to stand up and, and be an ally, you know, vocally in the moment to, to help somebody? How do you see that playing out, Rachel? Like that, because I, I, I've, it's, it's interesting to talk about and, and how, do, how do you be an ally and an advocate and to stick up for someone without, to provide them support with, without kind of making it about yourself. I think that yeah. that's one of the things that in those sort of, sort of moments of how do you make sure that the person who's been hurt is cared for and then to stop the harm like those, those questions of how to go about doing it are, it's hard because it's, it's, it's definitely an unnatural thing. Um, I can remember it, I was covering the Super Bowl in Detroit and it was one of the first times that I'd ever seen this happen. I've seen it happen a couple of times since, but there was a group of black women who were next to us at the bar. I was there with a couple other journalists and the bartender who had been serving us was kind of ignoring them. And then came back over and then she said, and I was kind of waiting, I was next in line and she said to him, are you going to tip us properly? And the woman was like, well, what the hell does that mean? And then me and the other guys started like screaming at the bartenders about like, that's ridiculous. And we want to talk, we want to see your manager, like fully carrying the, the part of it. And afterwards it was like, it was kind of a spectacle. Like I'm not sure, we were mad and I was glad we, we, we shouted something, but those questions of how do you, how do you advocate for fairness without, without making it about you being the white savior that's there to defend anyone from being treated. Those are, they're, they're tough questions of, of how to do it. It's, it's not, it's not a comfortable thing and not a natural thing to do. And usually I've tended to just get mad, which I don't think is the best way to do it either. Uh, Mike Seattle has a thought. Hey, it's me again. Um, just about ideas about um, standing up for someone in the moment. Um, I heard a while ago, um, it was at this lecture about racism. It was at McCaw Hall, McCaw Hall a couple years ago. And there was this black woman who was like, a lot of white people always come to me and say, you know, what can we do? What can we do? And she was like, get you know, personally invested in um, in some sort of uh, was it? She's like uh, I'm mumbling my words. Uh, take a risk, like get personally um, responsible. Put something on the table that's yours, so you are invested in it. And she gave the idea of just like if you see a black person being pulled over, pull over and just watch. You know, just yeah. walk goes down, and 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 that sounds really easy, at least at least. But I did it for the first time about three weeks ago when I saw this black person. On um, there were like cop cars, and I saw you know this black black guy with you know cops around him. And I, at first, at first, I honestly I was like, that's being handled. I don't have to do this right now. This isn't my you know I, I got I got stuff to do. Yeah. And then, but my conscience was like, this is an opportunity. You got to do this. And so I pulled around and I stopped on the opposite side of the street and got out and I just stood there, you know, and the officers saw me and stuff, but, and it was hard. I mean, I'm a white male. I have nothing to fear really from an officer. Right. But it was still nerve wracking just to, you know, kind of put myself in that position of authority or not authority, but just like, um, kind of stand up to authority and just make sure that they are doing everything appropriate. And um, so it was harder for me than I thought it was, but I'm glad I did it. And it's just it's like so, small things like that that just happen in the midst of a, the uh, blink of an eye. And then you're given the opportunity of like, are you going to stand up for it? Or are you just going to, you know, that's being handled, you know, whatever. So um, that's just a thought that I got from her. Um, a while ago, so thank you. We have someone else, Danny, who was in a situation just like that recently. Hi, Danny. Oh. Oh, can you guys unmute? Oh yeah, unmute Danny. Unmute. Hi, I'm Rebecca, this is Danny. We were in a situation like that recently 
or did you want to? Oh, I have something, something else to chime in on um, regarding, so I'm in real estate, I'm a realtor. And one of the things <clears throat> I'm trying to do and trying to share this with my colleagues as a great idea. Um, if I have a listing that receives multiple offers, I, what, what we do is we put all of those on a spreadsheet with, you know, who's the real, who's the agent, who's the buyer. I've taken to leaving out buyer names recently, just so that people can't discriminate based on that. Um, yeah. And people also write, they write the love letters, you know, hey, Mr. Seller, take our offer. Um, I've also taken to not letting them see the love letters until they've chosen. Then you can see who won, but you can't, you know, you can't mm -hmm. look at their photo and see their name. And I'm trying to have my colleagues um, also do the same thing if they're in that situation, when the opportunity, opportunity comes up to uh, discuss that kind of a thing. Um, another thing that we act, are just talking about in the last couple of days, because I think in Texas, there's a movement to change the term master bedroom, which yeah. totally blew my mind. I didn't even think of that. And that's, of course, like it's so racist. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just learned that too. Hey, Danny, I have a question for you on that note, mm -hmm. just as far as, um, you know, removing the names and stuff. I've been wondering for a while about why realtors have their picture on their business cards and in all of your media, because like in most other jobs, you don't, come into anything with people seeing your face. And I was wondering if that affected business for people of color in that way. And what the, when that started, why people started putting their faces on the signs and the cards. Right, obviously because we're all so good looking. Um, <laughs> um, no, I don't, I thankfully I work at a company where our, our <clears throat> the owner of our company just doesn't want our photos on our cards. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's a real real estate's a horrible industry for diversity. And our the owner of our company, our office is on Green Lake, um, and he. I don't know if this sounds good or not, but he literally. No matter what their credentials, he will hire a person of color if they come interview, <laughs> because he just he's trying really hard to diversify our office. But it's it's tough. I mean, we have a hundred, almost a hundred agents at our office, and I think we have one Asian person and three uh, people from the GLBTQ community. So it's like, it's a, it's a tough battle there, but he's, he's trying, we're trying. And I wish I, I wish I had a, a good answer for uh, an easier way to diversify. Yeah. But I was going to say, Mike, we had a similar situation. We were driving back um, from the coast recently and there just what last week or so. And there was, um, we drove by, a uh, black guy who was pulled over by a cop just on the other side of the road going opposite directions and both of us stopped and we're like should we turn around should we pull over and there was no other cars it was a really quiet little rural road and we didn't we're so lame we didn't and but we are still talking about it you know even you know before you brought up your point mike we were like gosh makes me think of you know we really should have done that and again i feel like it would have been like, oh, here come these two white people. We're going to pull over and we're going to, you know. Save the day. Yeah. It was such, it, yeah, I still don't know what the right thing to do would have been, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I still thinking about it, you know, I feel like maybe just pulling over and like making up an excuse, like, you know, letting, taking our dogs out to pee or something like that out of the car or just kind of hovering. But um not, I, I don't know, but that's why we're reading the book and why we're trying to get more involved. And um, yeah, but I'm proud of you for pulling over Mike. <laughs> and I hope that I'll do, I'll find a reason to, you know, a way to do that next time. Yeah, thanks. I'm I get it. I, I understand that feeling of that you would feel uncomfortable or like, is this the right thing to do? I totally understand. I guess just recently what we've been seeing or something that has come up is you know, nothing that we're seeing in society is new. It's just that it's being documented because everybody has a little camera and a little video recorder. And so, um, yeah, I guess that's the way that, that a lot of these cases are becoming public is because of that documentation. But I totally understand how it's weird to do it <laughs> when you're not used to it. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I, I have the same sort of feeling that Rebecca's just voicing there where I'm, I'm not sure what the right thing is. I, I can, I can ask some people, I'll ask people from both the law enforcement perspective, but also from, 
from black people I know about what is, because I know my interactions have almost entirely been positive with law enforcement. And I, I know that's a reflection of my privilege. Um, but, but that idea of what impact or influence, what's the best way to, to use that privilege to make sure that everyone feels that they're protected by law enforcement. Um, what are the, what are the best ways that we can, we can do that? I, I can, for our next meeting, I'll report back. I'll ask some people and see if I can get some better answers about what, what are things that we can do? And is, is that a good thing to stop and watch? Like, is that something that, that would be considered either helpful or protective by, by people who, uh, who, who might be having a black person who might be having that encounter with law enforcement? Mike says there's a chapter later in the book that kind of talks about that. Oh, Mike's been reading ahead. Yeah, Mike. Mm. <laughs> ah, I see how it goes. Um, Brian wrote in the comments, GitHub has eliminated the long accepted and used coding terms master and slave to references to references projects on their platform. The master bedroom thing, like you said, I had not ever thought about that, but that's what it meant. It's just one of those things you're just so used to hearing. It's crazy. There was a, I don't know if anybody listens to the Sportful, that's a food podcast that's really good. And they did a whole episode recently about the word plantation and how often that's used on menus to describe an item, even though it has nothing to do with anything. Uh, and just kind of, there's like a certain feeling that these people who develop recipes or, or menus feel like that word evokes and it never has anything to do with race to them, but it's one of those words also just like master bedroom that it doesn't need to be there to describe chicken <laughs> at, at, at Applebee's. Uh, let's see, all right. So no other, I don't, unless there's somebody who wants to speak, hold on a second. Um, if anybody else wanted to speak, speak up now, but otherwise we're at eight o'clock. Um, and if you want to break off, if there's anything that you feel like you wanted to talk more about in detail or that you didn't get a chance to speak, um, comment now and we can let you do that. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us and for reading and participating in the conversation. I hope that you learned a little bit. And again, I enjoy seeing everybody's face because my job is sitting in a little room talking to <laughs> one or two people, especially now with coronavirus, talking to myself in the room. Uh, so it's really nice to see your faces. And uh, I really appreciate all of you guys. And um, we'll have another meeting and, and, you know, do what Mike did and read the rest of the book. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Thank you guys. Take care. Bye.